from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The era of AI everything continues to excite, but unlike the internet era, where any company announcing a dot-com anything immediately rose in value, the AI gods appear to be more selective. NVIDIA beat its top line whisper number by more than $300 million and the company's value is rapidly approaching $1 trillion. Marvell narrowly beat expectations today, but cited future bandwidth demand driven by AI and the need to connect multiple accelerators like GPUs in, the data, in, in data center size clusters. And that stock is up more than 20% today as well. Broadcom is up nearly 10% on sympathy with the realization that the connect centricity trend beyond the CPU is what Broadcom does really well. Meanwhile, other players like Snowflake which also narrowly beat earnings Wednesday and touted AI as a tailwind, got hammered as customers dial down consumption, uh, similar to the trends that we've seen in cloud momentum, but again, Snowflake's up today with the tech momentum. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we look at the infrastructure of AI, examining the action at the silicon layer, specifically around NVIDIA's momentum, and since much of the AI is about data, we'll look at the spending data on two top data platforms, Snowflake and Databricks, to see what the survey data says. And to do so, we have a special breaking analysis panel. We're, 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 we're changing our normal trend. We're here with John Furrier, who's in studio, and our good friend, David Floyer. John, awesome to yeah. see you. Thanks for coming. You're in town this week yeah. for Red Hat Summit. And David, good to see you. We were talking earlier about uh, your, your life. You said, what'd you say? We said, how are you enjoy, enjoying your retirement? What'd you say? <laughs> Busier than ever. <laughs> yeah, well, and I'm glad you're still on top of the trends here. Uh, let's get started. Two years ago, Floyer and I published this. Basically, it was a roadmap of NVIDIA's plan to take a massive chunk out of Intel's general purpose data center dominance. And our positive outlook on the companies prospects specifically were related to its software expertise and the end-to-end -end capabilities, not just the GPUs, but the tens of thousands of other components and the, the networking and the intelligent NICs and that whole stack. And guys, if you look at NVIDIA's results, that vision appears to be coming to fruition. NVIDIA's valuation is now around eight and a half or nine times that of Intel. And John, you called ChatGPT the web browser moment, and Jensen calls it the iPhone moment. Either way, NVIDIA blew away its numbers, $670 million revenue beat. It cited uh, its second half supply is going to be significantly better. It's really hard to get product today, but David, let me start with you. We, we were pretty much right on two years ago. NVIDIA's value, as I said, is way, way surpassed Intel's and has been a massive catalyst for not only NVIDIA, but the entire industry. I, I agree, and um, what's driving it is parallel computing. Um, the, the necessity to uh, bring many, many, many more CPU cycles, simpler CPU cycles uh, into the game. And uh, NVIDIA have led with their GPU. And when you look across the uh, whole uh, of the uh, 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 all the other companies. You see people like Tesla have invested very aggressively. They've in invested far more in neural networks. You see Apple have invested heavily uh, and again, neural networks. Uh, all of it uh, parallelizing uh, uh, the hardware to bring much, much more uh, CPU, simple CPU technology to bear. And uh, People like uh, a, a, people like Intel in particular, they have just fallen far, far behind. And uh, I personally am not not believing that Intel is in a good place at all. And and, and uh, uh, they'll survive long term. But, but yeah, you not felt that way for a while, point. David. I mean, we're, we're going to come back and talk about the competition. But John, you know, you, you've seen many movies. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, what do you think? Is uh, how is this one? Is it similar? Is it different? Uh, how is it different? Uh, the is this an incumbent trend? Is this a disruptive trend? Is it both? 
No, I think it's I think it's just a continuation of what David was saying. NVIDIA was well positioned from day one. The, the GPUs, they invested in software stack and hardware, uh, and they captured early imagination and growth of the crazy hyped up markets, first crypto and now AI. If you look at the crypto craze, they they really pumped out a lot of stuff on, on the GPU, so good for them. Check, now that's kind of in a nuclear winter. Now the shift goes to AI, and then now it's all about cloud optimized GPUs. So we're starting to see that hyperscale next gen happening. And I think the issue with, with uh, NVIDIA is, do they maintain the margin and, and increase uh, more competition? Because you know what uh, the old expression that uh, Jeff Bezos, your margin is my opportunity. I think there's going to be a competitive battle. And I think Intel will have a nice server dominance still. You're seeing Xeon and classic customers, their OEMs. But in terms of these emerging markets, you got to have the connectivity at the chip level. It's, it's cloud optimized silicon, I think is a real big game and all the action will be at the physics. And AI is not just that G chat GPT, this physical layer is huge. And I think this is going to be a massive wave. It reminds me of the OSI model, you know, the physical layers got taken care of first and then it kind of stopped the TCP IP. But I think everyone gets all hot and bothered by chat GPT because it shows the ubiquity of the magic. Uh, but really the action will be uh, into silicon cloud optimized. Jensen calls that he's saying the data center should be is going to be called the AI factory, and basically he's saying there's going to be a massive shift in spending toward AI powered or you know accelerated computing, and obviously that's self-serving, but and they're all, they're also very well positioned there. All right, the cube, as you know, uh, John and David, we have an awesome community, and I recently had a conversation with a really deep AI expert who told me this. He said. The people doing AI love Jensen because he's a baller, a reference to like a basketball you know, player, a person with game. But if he really wants to democratize AI, he needs to lower prices. We need more competition. We'll see new GPUs from AMD. We'll use Intel. We, we said we use Intel GPUs, even though they're suboptimal <laughs> because we need other sources. So with that as a backdrop, I want to look at some of the silicon competition to NVIDIA, we can riff on this and, and some of the other firms, you know, possibly getting an, an AI boost. I mean, it's interesting when you think about, you know, that comment, um, uh, NVIDIA, you mentioned the margins, their margins are in the high 60s and they have Intel-like margins, yeah. right? You remember yeah. Intel's monopoly is sort of following that, that same track and supply is low so they can charge for it. Uh, David, I mean, we talked about uh, uh, NVIDIA uh, AMD is going to have a, a solution uh, for sure. Intel, we mentioned. What about ARM? Um, you mentioned earlier Tesla and, and Apple. Uh, they do their own GPU designs with ARM. And you and I talked about this before when, when we thought NVIDIA was going to be able to acquire ARM. You felt like the, that eventually NVIDIA would or maybe should adopt a more ARM-like ar architecture. They have an ARM-like architecture, but really drive that but we talked about maybe the DNA of NVIDIA wouldn't allow that. What's your take on that now? Well, it, it, they have gone very hard on CPUs and, and they fitted the, the problems to CPUs extremely well. Uh, the CUDA software is uh, brilliant. They, they have both the hardware and the software. When you look across the market, I'm always interested in uh, what the uh, personal computing is doing, the consumer computing is doing. And Apple have led there uh, for a whole number of years with uh, AI. Um, they, they put in neural networks. They are very, very expert in, in doing that. Um, so uh, I think neural networks will take uh, a significant role. And, and I think will NVIDIA will... Uh, go in that direction as well. Uh, they, they'll use both the GPUs and and the uh, they, they'll put in more neural networks. If you're looking at people like Tesla, they've invested very heavily again in neural networks. Um, they uh, do not want to use GPUs in particular, particularly for inference work. Um, and both their central uh, uh, their central work and their uh, distributed in the cars uh, are very very strong on neural networks. Um, but the 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 main key of this is bringing the cost per uh, cycle of a CPU down, being bringing much much more compute power to problems to AI problems in in specifically, and it's not just yet. 
chat P P GPT, it's all the other parts of uh, AI uh, that will continue to drive the, the whole market towards, in my opinion, towards uh, a, a dramatic amount of automation. Automation for me is the end product of what all of this is about, ability to automate things which we just couldn't do before. All right, hold that thought because we're going to come back to that topic of automation. Alex, bring out that last slide again, will you? Because I want to get John's input here because the other competition here, John, is you got the, the hyperscalers. AWS is, you know, we know designing its own chips. Google and, and Microsoft have announced uh, uh, AI you know, products, uh, 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 GPU class products. Alibaba uh, went with Risk Five you know, recently, and we know China looms large. There's a lot of activity in China. Uh, what are your thoughts on the hyperscalers participating in this market? Well, I, I think it's going, they're going to be a factor. In fact, David Floyer wrote some research a couple of years ago. I remember the hyperscaler talking about the physics aspects and, and Amazon's investment in the physics. James Hamilton, who used to run all that, now Peter DeSantos does. They've been doing this for a long, long time. And they're, they're not new to AI. When, and Microsoft came out with that big announcement, which was very scripted. It was very much to capture the minds, hearts and minds of the press and the, and the world. They did that with ChatGPT. They paid $10 billion for it. But they don't really have a lot of silicon experience. They have data center experience on running a large scale infrastructure from MSN background and, and going forward. And we kind of know that history. But Amazon Web Services has more silicon experience and has been working to optimize that, squeezing every ounce of, of, uh, of, of pr productivity out of the equipment. I mean, every small improvement on the physics will, will yield. So I think that's a big, a big factor. Um, we'll see if they can turn that into a service. I know for a fact AWS is, is now aggressively putting generative AI out there in their messaging. They're trying to re-educate the world that they have been doing AI for a long time. So I think there's a consumer vibe here, but I think Amazon's well positioned. And again, I think another level of competition and companies are forming from the crypto bubble bursting. There are literally the crypto mining companies that have essentially data center quality, hyperscale quality GPU farms. So you're going to see that as potential new entrant that might come out of, out of left field. But again, it's going to come back down to who wins in these hypes, hype cycles. The hosting providers or the web, it was, uh, you know, buying boxes, hosting them, paying for bandwidth, Exodus communications uh, and others like that. So here you'll see hyperscales play well and then upstarts uh, fill the gap where there's needs. But I think there's going to be, there's going to be a surge back to data centers. You can get some GPUs, you can rack and stack some GPUs and make that an on-premises uh, value. You don't really have to over-provision the GPUs. If you, if you know what you need, you can just do it. So I think there'll be a pop on on-premise uh, and a mix of hyperscalers for the, for the elasticity. Uh, thanks, do you, David, do you think the example of Annapurna with with AWS and John, I'd be interested in your opinion here too, because so uh, AWS started with Intel, uh, wasn't happy with the performance, and I'm certain it wasn't you know happy with you know the the, the price because uh, it had to pay Intel you know class margins, but then they still use Intel extensively. Don't get me wrong, they're a big partner of AWS, but they started they went from uh, Intel and then they brought in AMD. That didn't do what they wanted. That didn't satisfy them. So they, they started partnering with Annapurna, then they bought the company, then they did the, the ARM-based designs, they brought that in-house. In do you think they can do sort of a similar approach with respect to competing with NVIDIA to, to lower their cost, lower the cost per query, lower the cost of energy is another big thing, or is it Andy Jassy's, there's no compression algorithm for experience. Uh, and, and NVIDIA's been at this for, you know, 15 yeah. years since they sat around the Denny's trying to figure out, you know, the future. What, what do you think, David? Well, I, the uh, Annapurna uh, acquisition was the best, uh, was it 300 million they ever spent? Um, that was just right. amazing value. And, and yes, they have improved, they've separated out the control and put all of that on arm and offloaded that from the, uh, uh, the, the processors, the Intel processors. So they have done that part of it extremely well. Um, uh, they need to do, uh, they do have uh, also some uh, capabilities in AI. Um, I think they are going to buy uh, a lot of NVIDIA stuff. Um, that's uh, clearly the market leader. Um, they will try and, and improve their own, but 
uh, they will buy uh, Nvidia as well, uh, but as as will all the other people in the in the marketplace in in, in the hyper marketplaces. I don't think uh, uh, I, I don't think Microsoft is yet up to speed to be able to produce such chips. I mean, the quality of the Nvidia chips, the size of them, the degree of integration, uh, the ARM ARM uh, technology that they're using, and the TSMC uh, that they're using is is state of the art. And and I don't think that, in my opinion, AWS will be able to avoid um, buying from Nvidia as well. Well, and, and, and Jensen stressed on the call, he does many times that they've got like 35,000 components on their system, you know, beyond just the GPU. But John, there's also a lot of startups in this game. And yeah. so could AWS potentially, like it did with Annapurna, pick up one of those startups and then, and then change the game like it did with, yeah. with using R. Maybe instead of going with a classical GPU brute force approach, they can maybe use some uh, kind of neural network. I, I'm not approach. sure. I'm not sure, Dave. I think, you know, David pretty much nailed it. It's hard to replicate. The barriers to entry is hard. I mean, the old expression, better be lucky than good sometimes. And the Annapurna acquisition, I think was so much value that that doesn't happen very often. I think of companies like YouTube, you know, oh my God, they paid a half a billion dollars for YouTube. They did $41 billion as an example <laughs> of one of the best acquis VMware get bought by EMC. You know, those only happen in a generation. Is there a potential startup out there? Maybe. Um, can they get the magic formula? It's hard. So I think Amazon will continue to buy Nvidia, like David said, but also try to build it. They have to. I mean, if you're Amazon, you're not going to sit around and wait for be a, have a dependency because you know they're going to be at, at, at the beck and call of Nvidia in terms of pricing. Uh, one other thing, Alex, if you bring up that logo slide again, um, I was I was catching up on my Warren Buffett um, last weekend. You know, he sits there for six hours with Charlie Munger, Munger eat, eat, drinking Coke and eating peanut brittle. And one of the things he said, they asked him, why did you sell TSM? And he said, it was a great stock. I, I love, I like the great company. I love the company, but he's just concerned about the geopolitics. I mean, and we get China on this slide. We know China is really, you know, trying to get self-sufficiency. I mean, to the extent that China were to take over Taiwan, that is a huge risk. I mean, Nvidia, people seem to be ignoring that now with the, with the stock headed toward trillion dollar value, but but that could be, you know, a wild card, you know, to watch out for. All right, let's shift gears and look at Snowflake Quarter and talk about uh, where it fits in AI. The reason we say Snowflake, you know, catches a cold is because they narrowly beat, but we're very, really cautious about the outlook, citing more tepid consumption patterns relative to the past, like the cloud guys, you know, seen. But they're still really strong, by the way, and customers. You know, but they're optimizing. They're doing things like reducing retention policies, which lowers storage costs, and that means lowers revenue. It makes queries run faster, so that means less compute. That means less revenue. Um, but the other thing is, C uh, CFO Mike Scarpelli, the poor guy, was hacking all through the earnings call. <laughs> he's, he's really sick. But um, the thing I want to talk about is Snowflake's play to be the iPhone of data apps, or maybe it's better to say the App Store, if you will. They want to be the best platform to build data apps, better than hyperscalers, better than Databricks, better than anyone. And they've made some acquisitions like Applica, uh, and, which is a large language model, and now uh, Neva, uh, which to me kind of supports the vision of Snowpark, bringing together search and generative AI and, and NLP. You know, John, I know you're high on Databricks, uh, who's by the way, doing very, very well. We're going to show that in a moment. And David, you're not as optimistic on, on Snowflake and it <laughs> kind of brings us to real time data. David, let's start with you. What's your position on this? Well, um, I've said uh, for, for many years that the key to for companies is to do what Uber did um, when they introduced their uh, software, which is to reduce the number of people in 10 years by 10 times, uh, 10 in 10. Um, that's my belief of what companies need to be able to do to fend off newcomers coming in with new architectures of designing companies around AI and around the ability to have very, very few people because of automation. And that automation will be distributed uh, all uh, around to the edges where necessary. Uh, in other places, it'll be centralized. But that automation is what uh, is key. And, and to provide automation, you have to have 
uh, the transactional data coming straight to you, and you have to have the uh, analytic data there as well, as much as you can. Uh, and they have to share the same databases. They have to minimize the amount of um, of time, elapsed time between everything to be able to drive in real time the automation. So it's real time automation and the systems that will provide that, that I think uh, uh, in the long term will win. Now in the short term, it, it does, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, Snowflake will do very well. Um, but in the long term, I don't think their architecture it will support what I've just been saying. You have to have a much more direct from the where the data sources are to the uh, applications running very, very close to where those data sources are. And I don't see their cloud approach. Uh, it'll provide some goodness in that uh, setup but not, won't be the center of it. Now, John, the, 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 da the data bricks, I want to sort of follow up on that because basically I'm inferring from David, you're saying the, the, the cloud, the remote cloud, that's not the place to do you know, real-time inferencing at the edge, for example, but we want to maybe come back to that. Well, but John, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the Hadoop crowd largely was subsumed by Databricks, right? Spark yeah. gonna kind of killed, Spark in the cloud killed Hadoop. And Databricks do it very, very well. We'll show some data in a moment. Uh, and you're really high on on Databricks. I, I know am. you've you've interviewed Ali Goetze many yeah. times, uh, and and you're sort of close to that Silicon Valley vibe. What's your take on all this? Well, David's right. I mean, I think there's two two things going on here in the data infrastructure world. One is we went from 2010 Hadoop to Spark, and then the stuff that we've been covering and reporting on, where Databricks and Snowflake have taken advantage of this the the, the, big, the big data wave that actually played out. I think AI is going to absolutely change that. Into, I have a radical view on this. I think it, it's, it's, my thesis is that the infrastructure opportunities to change the platform will shift. And I think that's going to put Databricks and Snowflake both on their heels relative to can they use their market power to either acquire or take new territory or take the right high ground in what AI will force with automation. David mentioned a few things transactional data. I think the notion of databases will go away completely. I think it'll be invisible. I think with automation and AI, developers will program data and they need access to data because the speed of insights will come down to not physics. Yeah, latency will be there, there'll be table stakes, moving packets from point A to point B. Time to insights will be what data is available to prompt and tune with automation. So this whole prompt engineering chat GPT concept that people are now learning in the mainstream is essentially a call to a data set. So if you don't have data available or data as code, and manage all that compliance, you might be on the wrong side of the insights, which is going to be where the value is. So I think there's going to be an absolute platform reshift on what will be available for data. And I think this idea of, no, of databases will just be automated. Like data will be stored, it'll be managed for AI, not the other way around. And data, where data is stored will be dictated by the developers and the applications, per David's point about transactional data. So I think there's going to be a complete script flip happening. And, and to me, I like Databricks because they're more open source. So the question is, does proprietary win or open source? So, you know, Snowflake's like the iPhone and Databricks is like Android, I guess would be my weird example. But I think, you know, right today, those guys, are, Databricks is going to do well because they're open source uh, and they do well with the cloud. Uh, Snowflake does great because they got a great cloud, data cloud positioning, but it's basically a data warehouse. So I think there'll be a, a, a shift where they could be toppled over faster than what they did to data warehousing and, and cloud era. So, so to me, it took what six, seven years. I think it could happen in two years. And see, less I'm than, more than two years. And I'm higher on Snowflake because I don't see it as a data warehouse. I do see it as a data platform. They call it a data cloud. And I think, for example, to, to your point about open source, they support you know iceberg table formats. And if you might say, well, that's a checkbox item, but yeah. if you actually look at that, if here's my thinking: is if they can make uh, building applications easier than anybody else, better, easier than the cloud, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and they can make queries run on from iceberg tables and they can do them faster and more cheaply than anybody else, then they can increasingly do that with other open source 
uh, platform. So, so well, that's going to be if kind I of can interesting inter to watch. If I can interject one thing, I was just watching uh, on CNBC. They talk about the VCs and all these hot takes around AI. They're all most of them are just anecdotal, you know, recycled pa pattern matching from other waves. But I think when you talk to the smart VCs, the trend that's going on right now that a lot of the smartest people that I know are looking at is developer traction. If developer communities pick up a tool, which, and it could be just a simple tool, it doesn't be a platform and there's consensus around making that faster and increasing productivity, those technologies get adopted very fast. It's almost like a, a crowdsourcing of developers and some call it you know, B to D, business to developers. If developers pick up a tool and it works well and it solves a problem, there's mass adoption that shifts the entire market. These are the kind of things that you're going to see. And I think with data, no one's actually built tools for programmers and app developers to manage data. It's always managed by somebody else, a database administrator, someone in IT. So the data placement and the data management is handled by non-developers. That potentially is a wild card, Dave. And I think that to me is where, if you see something happen in open source where developers get traction, the app market could change significantly. That's where the refactoring could be. That's what David's point was saying is that that, that value shift could happen very quickly. And that's, that's David, that's Snow, Snowflake's big bet with Snowpark, that that is going to be the yeah. developer platform. Yeah. So they've got, obviously they have a challenge to attract developers. I think they're going to, they're going to try to redefine the concept of developers, but you had, you had another point that you wanted to make, but uh, please go yeah, ahead. Yes, if I may, uh, um, I, I, I think in the short term that, that you're right, but the, the, if you're going to automate, um, you, uh, the, the, the impact of uh, data to inform people goes down. Uh, so automation is getting rid of all of the people and automating every, every aspect of that. Now, you need data in order to run the transactional system. It needs a lot of data from all sources in order to optimize. Um, but it is an optimization as opposed to uh, an essential. Uh, requirement. It'll get as much data as it can to be able to run in real time. And real time is different in, in different industries. Um, you know, in uh, in Uber, it's not sub-second, you've got seconds, but it's still pretty fast that it has to be able to do things. Other things will be actually real time to prever preserve the consistency. And if you look at the best ways of providing consistency, databases have been and always will be the best way of doing that. The difference is that they will be distributed. They'll be distributed around, it, it, they'll be in the center and they'll be all around the places where the data comes from. And you will want that database because that's the most efficient way to, to, to program, uh, you know, uh, the idea of the, the idea of uh, the NoSQL databases where the programmer looked after it, they di that died years ago. And I, I don't believe that's going to be resurrected. You, you need databases. Are they the same databases? No. And there'll be lots of opportunity uh, for, for new databases. But the fundamentals of a database and a single database which does your transaction and your uh, end user, I still think will be here for the next 20, 30 years. I mean, I, I don't see any way that you can avoid having that technology, which is so much, gives so much, um, takes so much off the plate of the, of the developers. And um, going to the developers, I mean, the, the developers will use lots of new, there's so much opportunity uh, to provide developers with tools. I totally agree. Um, and there'll be two types of uh, development. There'll be the, the central development that runs the automation, and then there'll be the massive amount of data coming from everything that will be there uh, and will we'll, we'll provide data for improving uh, the AI and improving things over time. But uh, I personally believe uh, that, um, uh, that the, the, the database will stay, uh, it'll be a distributed database, um, and that will be how automation is put into place in reality. Yeah, and, and I companies don't do it in the next 10 years, they will be out of business, in my opinion. I, I, I still think my BI market's huge, and I think that's really where the, yeah, no, it's going to be a lot, of, a lot of money. And, and I think that a lot of that data is still going to get into the, to, the, to the data platform, and it's going to be analyzed. And, and, 
But but you're right. I mean, it's not going to be Snowflake wants everything to be in Snowflake. That's a prerequisite yeah. so it can govern it. And that's its value proposition. And they're not going to be doing distributed queries unless something new comes along. And to your both your point, I mean, yeah. that's what Bob Mugley is working on is his new type of database. So, all right, let's bring up the next slide, which looks at some of the ETR data on Snowflake and just get into that a little bit. I'll set up the slide. If you guys have comments, that's cool. If not, we've got a couple of data slides here. What this shows is a progression over time of, of the net score granularity for Snowflake. And net score is a measure of spending momentum, spending velocity, that's that blue line. And you can see how it's come down. Back in January 22, Snowflake peaked up in the 80 plus percent. They were like 83, 84, 85% um, of, of net score, which is incredible. Um, and But you can see it's come down substantially. That yellow line is, is called pervasiveness. That's the, the, the presence in the survey. So it's like the survey mind share or market share inside the survey, not in the specific market. The the bright green, that's new ads. The the uh, the forest green is spending 6% or more. The, the gray is flat spending. And you can see that's the big trend, right? It's gone up. People said, all right, the budget is is flat. Uh, Slootman said on the earnings call, the, the CFO is in the business, <laughs> which I, I got to laugh at because I guarantee his CFO is in the business. Mike Scarpelli's all over their business. <laughs> you know, they got that covered. The uh, If you go back to that slide, Alex, please. The, um, the pinkish area, that's spending less. And the red is churn. And I really want to make this point. It's not like they're losing customers. This is very similar to the cloud guys. This is very mm -hmm. sticky. Yeah. So the churn is virtually non-existent. Um, but that shift toward the, the the fat middle of flat spend and some of the big customers, you know, spending less because of optimization has brought this this down a little bit. I don't know if you guys have any comments on this. I guess, so. actually, let's bring up the next slide too and then you guys can comment. The next slide really talks to, um, uh, it compares Snowflake and Databricks and over time. And I, we added Streamlit as well, which is like a, a Python, you know, a, 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 a tool chain for data scientists which is an acquisition that Snowflake made. But you can see what the progression has been for the last several quarters. Snowflake, as we said, has come way down. Databricks and Snowflake, in terms of momentum, are starting to converge. But look at the move that Databricks has made to the right. That's the, the, the presence and the overlap of customers is also significant. I, I forget the exact numbers, but there's a very large number or percentage of Snowflake and Databricks customers you know, the rap guys is always, you know, a lot of people say it's going to be easier for Databricks to get into Snowflake's territory. That's what they're trying to do mm -hmm. with, you know, the, with their lake house. And others say, well, I think it might be easier for Snowflake to get into the data science world. And, you know, time will tell. But uh, John, do you have any thoughts on all this data? Well, I think the, ch the churn data, the slide with the churn data is accurate. There's not a lot of churn. It's a market slowdown on spending given the economic headwinds. But also when you have these big market movements like AI right now that's hyped up, it tends to freeze the buyer market. People tend to take a pause. Most cycles I've lived through has had that kind of like, let's wait and see, plus the headwinds. We've seen the refactoring, I'm not refactoring, uh, cost optimization. I don't think it's such no place going away. They're going to have a good, they got a great business model. And they were way ahead of Databricks. Um, Databricks, however, has gotten traction in the open source community and their products have been getting more robust. They've been adding more announcements. They also rode the AI way by interesting Dolly, kind of a joke on Dolly. So it's it's an AI product uh, and, it, and they're smart. And so I think they're just taking territory naturally because they have a fit with the market. And Amazon, they got good, they got good traction with AWS. Uh, and other clouds, like I was going multi-cloud with their approach. So again, Databricks and Snowflake, both different approaches, similar products, but just different approaches. And again, I don't, I don't, I think Open's going to win, but that's my opinion. But I, I think the slide's natural. I think Databricks has got traction. Uh, David, I want to ask you. So in, on the earnings call, Ramo Lenshaw, who I, I really like him, he's a sharp analyst. He asked the exact question that I would have asked had they let me ask the question. So is that that shift in? In data retention policies, and they, they, Snowflake cited one large customer was shifted from uh, retaining five years down to three years. Ramo asked, is that a potentially a long-term trend? I've seen this, I saw on Twitter the other day, I don't know, it was some developer, or maybe it was some Databricks snark. There was like this big ocean liner and, and it said, this is all your Snowflake data. And then it had a little tug, you know, a little, little speedboat and this is how much data you actually use. You know, use, the implication yeah. being we're, we're spending all this money on Snowflake, but we're actually not using it that much. So I thought Ramos' question was a good one. 
Um, and and uh, it was either Slootman, I think Slootman's answer was, no, this is a short-term trend or it's a trend that, that will end. He didn't say it's short-term. He said, this is a trend w- that will end. We've seen it before. Now, you and I have talked about this for a long, long time. You know, it, it, it's easier to just uh, leave all the data in there. If you have a budget constraint, now you got to go, you know, recapture wasted space. What are your thoughts on on that, uh, on two things, this data overall, and then specifically that question that, that Ramo asked? Well, uh, uh, I think uh, he was asking uh, much more on the short term. And and I think uh, exactly as you said, there, there will be reduction of data if you run out of money to hold it, uh, et cetera. Um, the yeah, most but what about long term? What about long term? Do you agree with Sloop and well, that, that it will that, come that's back? What I'm just yeah, sorry, to. go ahead. So the most valuable data is the data that's freshest. You know, the 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 value of data goes down dramatically um, uh, as, as it ages. So uh, just keeping data for data's sake is is not particularly valuable. And the the best way of doing it is to extract the value of the data as quickly as you can. So when you look, for example, at Tesla. Uh, in the car, they extract all of the value of the te- of the data, and then they hold it for ten minutes just in case there's an accident and they need to 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 keep that data. But after that, it's thrown away. And and if you think about it, the thought of having to capture all of that data is it would be mind blowing. I mean, it would just be so uh, astronomical. Uh, so they throw it away. Um, but they've captured the raw part of that data. So for me, when you're doing automation of any sort, most of that data is going to be thrown away and you've got to extract the data very close to the source of the data. And then that will that will uh, reduce the amount of data. So I, I'm not a fan of the thought that you know, the data is growing so rapidly and there's going to be you know large, large sources of it. It, it is at the moment because that's the way that data has been stored. It's had to be stored. But I think there are going to be far more efficient ways uh, when you come to automation uh, of just keeping the data for a certain length of time. And then uh, you've extracted the data and the amount of data that will be stored will go down over time. That's that's I'm oh, sorry, it won't go uh, so, down. It yeah, won't, it, oh, yeah. Won't, it I, I, won't go up the exponential curve. That well, it's doing I, well, we'll see. We'll see. Because I, I, I think my bet would be that you're right, that there'll be maybe a larger proportion of the data that we would have normally kept uh, is, is going to be ephemeral. But I think there's going to be so much data <laughs> created that actually the amount of data is is, is actually going to go up uh, uh, exponentially. It, and, and yeah, it, it, it's yeah. not going to go up at the same rate it's going up at the moment. I think the, well, I think we'll see. I think the curve is going to bend even steeper. We, we disagree oh, on that, but okay. but you're well, smarter than yeah. I am, so uh, we'll, well see. Well, no, no, he, the, the, the need for the data, I think he, where, where I see his point is, the need to store all the data in some use cases is not needed. Like he, the Tesla is a great example. Yeah, but it's easy. Yeah, but, but we're in a whole new l- l- industry now. And this is going to, again, this is the radical view. If you have a data language like OpenAI, which is massive amounts of large language model, and with the foundational model stacks, I believe there's going to be hyper data scalers, for lack of a better description. There will be some companies will emerge who will be the cloud-like scale for data. And those might be brokers, there might be a new service. But at some point, someone has to have that for foundational models. Because what we're seeing with the foundational models, the big get bigger and big get richer, right? So you're going to have like like Amazon. As Amazon becomes so big, there's only three hyperscalers. So I think there's a model where an application, I don't want to have to create a data infrastructure. I'm going to be using my data for real time or whatever the use case is. I'll throw it away and then have my domain data, which is proprietary and more valuable, maybe the fresh data, as David says, and I'll program that into a large language model, which I could either own or or have someone else do for me. So I think that might be an interesting scenario. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that exists today. I'm just saying that the debate going on right now is who, there is value in large data sets for AI. Historical data, patterns, all kinds of stuff, training. And if you look at the foundational model stacks right now, you have financial model ops, FinOps, fin, FM ops, underneath the, the foundational models and the tooling sits on top of it. So the middle layer is the training and ingestion. 
then the foundation model's developed, then you have the tooling that drives the apps. So that's a completely different animal than we're seeing in anything we, out there today. So, you know, you gotta, we, who knows how it's gonna play out, but there's a, there is an argument that says, hey, why not, why can't there be a data cloud? Like a legit data cloud, not like a snowflake of data bricks. I have no idea if that's going to happen, but I can see that. Why? Wait, valuable. why is that not legit data cloud? You're saying because it doesn't incorporate the real time. No, Jay was, Jason teasing out, teasing out a great point. I don't want to pay for storage if I don't need it. But if someone else does it for me, they can build the CapEx and I'll use it as I go. Uh, and they almost donate it to like an open source model. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Um, I want to end, speaking of layers, I want to talk about uh, the future of data apps and automation. And this is a slide that George Gilbert created. And, and he and I are going to take another stab at this. Uh, uh, actually, prior to Snowflake uh, uh, Summit and Databricks uh, Summit, we're going to be unpacking those two companies again. But basically, the premise here is that applications are moving from a process-centric world to a, a data-centric. And the point being that increasingly, instead of data residing in, in silos, uh, within sort of the, 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 in the data really being attached to the business process, flip that, the business and the process is going to be embedded in the data. So just sort of different, you know, look in the model. And this model here is it's got the, the apps underneath, the, the enterprise apps underneath, it's got this data layer, and we use Uber as an example. You've got riders and drivers and destinations and ETAs, you've got maybe products that you're delivering, et cetera. And those are all uh, data elements or data products that have coherence through a semantic layer and then move up the stack and that's the apps. And, 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 and this world is a different world. It, may requ it probably requires new databases. If you look at what Uber's doing, they're using uh, Google Spanner um, and they've built a, a layer on top of that to basically not have to make the trade-offs that they had to make prior to 2016. Um, and, and David, you have been making a point all through this uh, session about automation, that that is the key driver of value creation. So pick it up from there and explain what you mean. So yes, I, I mean, Uber is a, a really classic example. You look at the number of people in Uber compared with their revenue, it is the, the revenue per person is uh, out of this world. It's, it's unlike any other company um, in existence. So th that is, uh, that's amazing that they have done that and they have automated completely. They've taken, taken all of the data from the cars, from the people, uh, about the streets, what's, uh, what the road conditions are, and they're able to use that to optimize and r run the whole company. David, uh, David and, let me interrupt you. Correct. Uber's, I've just Googled it. Uber generated $971,000 per employee in 2022 compared to <laughs> about 600,000 in 2021. That is astounding. I mean, a typical software Absolutely. company, you're lucky if you're at two twenty-five, two hundred fifty thousand dollars per head. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's millions of, of, of people. So, so that's the way they've got done automation. And that's the model that everybody will have to follow if they're going to keep their, their, own, their current company solvent. Because in my view, the usage of these AI tools, the usage of, of, of the, of the real-time data will bring in competitors and startups, which will have a, just a much, much easier way of getting to, uh, to that uh, scenario rather than have to migrate from their current systems to that scenario. So that, that's to me the real, real threat long-term. If they don't do that 10 in 10, uh, ten uh, tenths of the people in 10 years, uh, they will be really exposed to, uh, to a lot of startups coming in. And, and if you think about uh, Elon Musk, I mean, he has come into the car industry and he has revolutionized the, the cost of doing things there. And he's produced software cars as opposed to hardware cars. And uh, he's done the same with SpaceX. So again, you look at his ability to drive productivity um, uh, in, in those two industries. That will have to be done by everybody for them, in my opinion, to survive. Um, and that does mean to say that, there, that there's, uh, there's a lot of other data other than the real-time data, but, but that's the one that's valuable. That's the one you have to capture. That's the one you make your decisions on in real time, which is what Uber has done. 
Well, and the last question I asked on that, that previous slide was, was, was this could be a disruptor or can incumbents capitalize? I mean, we're at Dell Tech World this week. You were at you know, Red Hat Summit, which is obviously owned by IBM. Both of those companies are going to be able to take advantage of AI. Snowflake's going to be able to adva you know, take advantage of AI. So is ServiceNow, so is Oracle, Salesforce, et cetera. But it feels like, John, that there's going to be some new model, like, like keyword search, which you were very heavily involved in in the early days, which people maybe poo-poo or, or overlook, yeah. and then becomes a dominant play in the industry. I'll give you the last word. I mean, I think what Dave was saying is a whole new paradigm shifts happening, platform, replatforming, refactoring, uh, startups going to come out, new unicorns will be born in this wave. And it comes back down to simplifying things, making it easier and reducing steps it takes to do stuff. And the web, I think, showed that the best it came out was laughed at early on, that things were missing, but those incremental improvements from what was the nascent market that was then went mainstream. And when it mainstream, when it went mainstream, those startups that worked on it captured the value and the rents. So I think AI is going to have a lot of that, but the big players are going to be also involved and they'll they'll be the benefactory of, of uh, benefactors of the of that value. So I think it's going to be more like the web and the internet than the iPhone. Hey, uh, John and David, thanks, thanks a lot for coming on Breaking Analysis today. This is a great session. David Floyd, so good to see you. Uh, you've been a, such a good friend over the years and, uh, and wishing, wishing you all the best as always. Thank you. All right, thanks also to Alex Meyerson, who's on production and manages the podcast, Ken Schiffman as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hope is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. And don't forget, check out all the, the videos at thecube.net. These episodes are all available as podcasts. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Appreciate you subscribing. I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. If you want to get in touch, email me directly, david.vellante at siliconangle.com. Pitch me, you can DM me at dvellante. Hit me up on LinkedIn, on our posts. If you, know, if you got a good pitch, I'll definitely respond. If not, don't take offense. We've got a lot of them. Please do check out etr.ai. They got some great survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for our guests for theCUBE Insights, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.